what is the biggest minotaur you faced in your life? Uh, the biggest minotaur I've faced the minotaur. So what, what is the metaphor here? So the minotaur is going through a maze. Or oh, no, is it chasing you in the maze? Yeah, well, the minotaur's a, a, a beast in the maze. So uh, your, your mind is a maze, life is a maze. So the minotaur is symbolic of the internal minotaur's fears, challenges, doubts, insecurities, the external yeah. minotaur's hardships in life. So, you know, basically what is your biggest fear or what has been one of the biggest fears you've had to face Mm -hmm. uh, you might still be facing um, mm -hmm. and, and how did you essentially overcome it? Yeah, I'm sure there's um, quite a lot trying to work out which one the biggest one is. I think the one that certainly comes up the most uh, is, is that entrepreneurial journey that I have naturally comes with um, a lot of, it's a, it's a balancing act. It's a balance you've pulled in many different directions and uh, entrepreneurs tend to have and I hope I'm not just rationalizing this and making it conveniently make sense for my own purpose, but I'm pretty certain most entrepreneurs have a, um, you know, they get into the shower, they have another idea, they step out of the shower, they have another idea, they have a breakfast, they have another idea. And, and I can be like that. And I think at the, the very start of my business journey was a lot further back than most people think it is it was sort of towards the end of my teens I, I always had a burning desire to be in business mm. and um my idea was um or, or generally my ideas were quite scattered there were there, there was quite a lot of different things that i wanted to do but not everything sticks and um they tend to not stick because you don't have a focus so the the, the biggest challenge, um, the big, the minor tour that I have is um, saying to myself, okay, I've had another idea. It seems great. It seems um, a money-making opportunity. It seems glamorous. It seems exciting, interesting, whatever it is. But I, I have to, uh, you know, a lot of people say no, try not to go towards, try not to, you know, get into the throats. Because I like that start phase as well. I like the infrastructure building bit. There's a real buzz. There's a lot going on. So I want to... You know, I have an idea. I had a, a property business idea a few weeks ago, and I thought, mm. right, that that seems fantastic. But I have to keep pulling myself away from that, and I just focus, focus, focus with my legal services business because that that really is now where I've carved out a good uh, business. It's it's growing. We're chipping chipping away. We're building the infrastructure, um, and yeah, it's just that balance because. The law firm also came from one of these, um, one of these scattered harebrain ideas. And had I not pursued it, then I will, you know, it wouldn't be what it is today. So there is both sides of this coin where some of these ideas have to be given, some credence have to be pursued, mm -hmm. and some of them should never see the light of day. Brilliant, brilliant. I mean, there's a lot to tackle in that. Uh, but before we do, I'd like to welcome everyone to another episode of the Minotaur's Maze podcast. My guest today is a corporate lawyer and managing director of Ali Legal, Mr. Akbar Ali. Akbar, thanks for being here and welcome. Thank you for having me. Brilliant. And, and before we dive deeper into that, uh, I mean, it's quite a, a massive topic anyway, so yeah. we'll, we'll take this out of it. Can you just give a quick overview about yourself and your background and then we'll dive deeper into the conversation? Yes. Yeah, so as, as you've just said, I'm the managing director of Ali Legal now. So my main job is to manage the practice that Ali Legal is. It's a city based corporate law firm. We have a triangle logo and we tend to do things in threes. Our financial models are in threes. Our service lines are in threes. We do corporate litigation and property as the high level service lines that we offer. And my journey into that position that I'm in today has been quite varied, quite, um, you know, I've had legal jobs, I've had non-legal jobs, I've been in other businesses as well. Um, so, and, and very, um, I don't, I think it's getting more and more, well, sorry, more, it's probably right, but more correct to say uh, it's becoming less and less atypical that people are in legal jobs with um, more, more sort of atypical backgrounds than they did previously. So I, my, my first child was born when I was 20. Mm -hmm. uh, my second child was born when I was 21. And my legal uh, education didn't start until slightly after that second oh. uh, second child. So I was already a father when when I did my law degree. 
Wow. Okay. And alongside it, so I did it part time. Alongside it, I, did, I sold gas and electric door to door because that job allowed me the flexibility to. I could go out, do my sales, then get myself to university. So I wasn't restricted with hours. I was restricted mm. getting the deals in and the outcomes. So I've picked up a lot along the way. And there's other things in that CV as well, where I sort of pick out the bits which inform my practice today. My clients are not interested in time spent. They're interested in outcomes in the same way that my employer, when I was selling gas and electric, was interested in the outcome of the sale. And I could see that once that outcome is met, I can then capture my time back to then go and do do something else, which in my case was to uh, legally educate myself. So quite a mixed CV, quite varied. And then it's led to the, um, the job that I have today. Brilliant. And I absolutely love that because it provides a lot of context with some of the questions I was going to ask. And mm-hmm. it's based on the fact that I had the traditional uh, upbringing, uh, which was go to college, university, law school, uh, and and then the corporate ladder. So when I jumped into business and entrepreneurship, I found it really, really difficult. Like I struggled a lot and and I'm not alone in that. I know a lot of lawyers struggle with this and even accountants, I suppose a lot of professionals. And it's normally down in my opinion, because with that traditional career path, you're always, you know, given guidance, you're told what to do, how to do it, and then you do it. But when business and entrepreneurship, you kind of lose that and, and it becomes a struggle when you've never been really trained on it. Whereas your experience has been a bit different in that you had that sales background before you went into law. So would you attribute your love for entrepreneurship because of that? Or was there some kind of other underlying factor which kind of fueled that passion for you? I think um, I can definitely attribute it there. And then there's the, the actual, you know, I had a, I had a news agent shop when I was quite young. So my, my parents and my aunties and uncles, that's what they were doing. So that's, I was seeing a lot of that and I was seeing commerce at work. And I think with um, shops, there's actual money going into actual tills and there's actual staff and actual stock. So all of the things in professional services, we do see the people side of it, but I think a lot of the line items that are in a set of accounts, they're, they're, almost, um, they're almost abstract. Whereas in a shop, it's all in front of you. So it's the accounts which are abstract and the professional side of it, which but the real stuff is is right there in front of you in plain view. You can see it. So it does attribute to my role and uh, the work that I do. But I think in a way that um, people don't necessarily appreciate because it attributes in a way that it's relatable to a client and therefore that story and the psychology around it aligns and clients can connect with it. But I think, you know, you found being um, the business owner difficult. I, I find that being the business owner is still, still difficult. Um, but the, there is just that facet of it where when I'm having a conversation with the client, they, they associate me understanding their pain mm-hmm. uh, with my background. And I'm sure to some degree that is that is absolutely the case. Um, but there's still a lot of, you know, we have, um, I'm trying to think of uh, one of our, somebody, somebody who say is in a construction business. I don't understand construction. I have to take time and do my research and ask the right questions and have those meetings and, and, and be in the client's business to eventually understand their business. But they, um, they almost um, associate me as somebody who's more, uh, more commercial, more understanding towards business, but I still have those same challenges. They just present themselves in different different mm-hmm. ways. Mm-hmm. You know, we have um, parts of our business that I understand um, much less uh, than I appear to understand sometimes, <laughs> and um, you have to you have to almost fake it until you make it, sort mm. of thing, um, and. Some, there, there's plenty of things that have happened in the business where I thought, oh my gosh, I'm so, I'm so glad that happened in, in, in the way that it did, when mm-hmm. it did. And it almost sometimes it just feels like luck. Uh, sometimes it just feels like a happenstance type thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and we get out at the other end of it and we, we continue. 
Mm. Uh, but sometimes I do wonder if that thing didn't happen at that time, you know, would we have would we have had some serious challenges that we'd have to deal with? Mm. Uh, we've had a lot of luck along the way as well. Brilliant, brilliant. And and so, what made you decide to then pursue the the legal career? Because obviously you've got this experience as business business and entrepreneurship. You've got the family businesses and stuff, and you're doing the door to door sales. Like what made you go into law? Like for me, for example, you know, there was no desire to go into law. Um, mm. It was one of those things coming from a, an Asian background. You have to become a professional in something. Um, I hated science and that kind of took out most of the professionals. Mm. Um, and there was, just, there was just lawyer left, really. Um, and, and that's why I got into law, but I never enjoyed it. But what yeah. was the catalyst for you to go into law despite having that kind of previous experience? Um, I think there was certainly an association, and I and I admit this almost in a in a slightly embarrassed way. Um, there was an association towards professional services and it being a bit more respectable, it being a bit more you know people can look up to you, and um, suddenly you're um, considered to be smart, considered to have a position in society, that sort yeah. of stuff. And I say that in, in an embarrassed way because. You, you do your education, you learn all these things, you spend time working on yourself and your own psychology and your own development and your own maturing. And then you say, well, I shouldn't be making any decisions based on what uh, you know third party's interpretation is. And that's certainly where I've arrived at now, but I've arrived here having set out from that point of view. Um, so I, was, I had a newsagent shop, it was in Aintree in Liverpool. I was running that shop and thinking, you know, I could do this for the next 30, 40 years. My father did that as well. We, we, we know how to run those shops. We can make good money out of them. And it's not, it, it's a challenging thing, but if you set it up, just like with any business, if you could, you can make a rod for your own back or you can make something that can be um, quite uh, beneficial to you and quite, quite liberating for you as well. And I don't think that depends on what, businesses it depends on how you've structured it there are people who own news agent shops who are um you know they have staff they have multiple sites they uh, might not make as much per site but they have their time they've recaptured their time back in a way that um, works for them and then there's people who are beholden to show you know never take holidays um can't get away from it they're, they're absolutely inside of that business so um so that that was really that's what that was the thing that got it going in that direction where i thought you know i do think i'm an intelligent person and i do think i can do a degree i do think i can do formal education i think there's all this business about certainly in society we you know people have to have a degree and you know they have to go through academic institutions so there's a lot of there was a lot of that weighing on me at that time as well and i guess something to prove just like just like a lot of um, young young people, and maybe more so, dare I say, it, a lot of young men, uh, where they have to say, you know, here's my utility, here's what I've done, here's what I can provide. Um, so I had a lot of that weighing on me, and it wasn't easy to do because I was very much restricted. Once, once, um, and I say this with a qualification as well in that my, my children to me have always been a privilege and I don't want to ever refer to them in a way that they've hindered me in any way, but I had to keep earning a little bit of money to support mm. my family. Um, I was restricted in geography terms, so I couldn't just say, right, you know, I'd like to go to Nottingham for university or whatever. So I had to be close to home, had to hold down a job uh, and, I was fortunate in that John Moores University where I attended, they offer a law degree, they've got fantastic teaching staff, they've got fantastic facilities, and they did a part-time course, which is 75% of the intensity. So I could do the three-year degree in four years, keep working in a job. I had to be a bit creative about what lectures I attended and what seminars I attended. I got into a little bit of trouble about uh, not, I did not have 100% attendance, but I very much did strategically what I needed to do um, to get a good uh, law degree and, and move on from there. So that's kind of what's set it off. You know, I've got a, I, I've got to be a professional. I've got to have a law degree. And then, as I've got into it more, I come into corporate law later. And I think I do wonder whether I would have stayed in law if I wasn't doing corporate Co corporate right. laws. Mm -hmm. Much less in terms of you know, I don't spend 
all my time reading thick books on civil procedure. Um, I don't spend a lot of time on case law. Um, that's not to say that I do I do a reasonable swath of technical, legal uh, research, reading, understanding. So the technical side of my practice is, is um, good. Uh, but then corporate lends itself quite nicely. It's quite a project-driven role. It's quite, there's a lot of, um, you know, working with a team involved, working with other professions, and it's it's a transaction. So it's it's making sure not only have we drafted the contracts, but has a particular contract been drafted in a, with a, within a particular timeline, um, and who's who's doing what and it's not always contract drafting it's sometimes it's moving an amount of money or it's getting an advice note from a tax advisor so it's just making sure all the things that need to happen happen um so this it's it's a project management job as well blended with a legal job so that's as a practitioner i enjoy that and then i start getting into the business side of it and mm -hmm. the business side of it i think it, it is challenging pii is the hardest thing for Lawyers generally, it's very expensive, but there's pros and cons with all businesses. So if I was running a marketing business, for example, um, with law, I wouldn't be paying the PII that I am. I wouldn't be having the regulators that I do. However, if I say to you, um, you need a lawyer because you're selling your house or you need a lawyer because you're about to sign a contract or you need a lawyer because you're selling your business, you know but that's the case. I don't need to educate you about what a lawyer, everybody knows what a lawyer is. So selling in legal services, I have competition. There's 9,000 other law firms in the country. Um, so I do have to, you know, why me as opposed to somebody else? But the marketing business, a lot of businesses don't know about SEO. They don't know how they could improve their brand. They don't know about digital and technological advancements. So you have to do the education piece then the differentiating piece. So yes. yep. I, I actually like law as a business. Um, and there, there is an element of me philosoph philosophically where I think, you know, this is where I'm at. This is where I'm shipping away. This is where my focus is. And whether it was this um, a, a wholesaling business, a cleaning business, a, a, a soup tailor, whatever it is you're doing if you it's it's about time spent and about focus and attention given um and what what you're doing at the core of it is not necessarily something which um you have to enjoy it and you have to obviously grapple with it and understand it but the surrounding infrastructure the chipping away the fine tuning you just do that over time and mm -hmm. with ali legal as a business i'm happy to say I'm nearing sort of four years into it now. I think it's the longest job I've held down, actually. <laughs> no, I can relate to that. Uh, my, my legal jobs didn't last, last very long. I think my <laughs> biggest one was probably four years, uh, but there, there were two years stints. I, I've um, got mates who were saying to me, are you going, I'm going to give you notice in at some point at Ali Lee? <laughs> 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 Brilliant. Uh, I mean, I know like I did have my own law firm as well, so um, it, it only lasted less than a year. Um, and, and for those that don't know, PII means in de indemnity insurance. So, you know, law firms are, uh, you know, required to get indemnity insurance, which is it can cost a lot. It can cost significant amounts of money. So, um, you know, running a business is hard. Running a law firm um, is even harder because you've got obviously these regulatory compliance um, aspects as well. Um, that's my opinion anyway. Um, and, and like you mentioned, you, you've got to enjoy it. And, and I didn't enjoy it. And I don't know, maybe if I did go down the corporate road, it might have been a bit different. Mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately, I got wrapped up more into the civil side and personal injury side, which, you know, <laughs> I hated every aspect of it. Um, and I suppose even when I was, you know, a young trainee or a paralegal, and, and you know, I worked for big city firms and I worked for smaller firms and the smaller firms were obviously you know they were run by people of southeast asian community and when i would mention to them why are we not getting into corporate law or or commercial law the pushback that i got the most was it's not for people like us you, you have to be really? of, of, of white skin and you have to have the contacts otherwise you're not going to get the the business so mm -hmm. i don't know if that was just cope where because they just didn't want to go down that road or whether there was an element of truth like i have come across lawyers that said you know they have to work twice as hard 
as mm. their, you know, uh, non-agent counterparts. What has your experience been? Obviously, before you ran the firm, I mean, I'm sure you worked in other law firms. Did you see any kind of issues or did you have to work harder or was it an equal playing field based on uh, the input you, you put in? You see, so in the most general sense, my attitude towards this has always been, and I think it's been a healthy attitude for me and it's worked for me, is that people carry prejudice and we will never get away from that. And sometimes they carry prejudice in a way um, and it might be a bit controversial for me to say, but they might carry prejudice in a way that um, is helpful to you. Um, and there is a fine line potentially between prejudice and, you know, I, I just connect with a particular person or I, I relate to a particular person. So I, we, we have quite a diversified portfolio of clients. Um, I, I have very... Um, old, established, white, blue-blooded, um, sort of those kind of clients. I have a Punjabi crowd, I have Pakistanis, Germans, Americans. Um, and I think if if I try to understand why that is the case, I'm near certain that it's because my attitude has always been that, um, well, people cry prejudice um, and, um, they, I, I truly believe they always will. And there's that, um, you know, there's tolerance, acceptance, there's integrating people. And I think we certainly should do whatever we can to bring about understanding of people from different backgrounds and different perspectives to bring people closer together. Um, and I have a, a kind of lofty idealistic principle of um, we're all citizens of the world, as as um, um, hippie esque and cliche as that sounds. That's that's just always genuinely how I felt, um, and that might may be why you know we have a very diversified team, uh, we have diversified clients, and what I'm looking for is: do you have a business to sell? You know, mm -hmm. do you have a contract to write? Do you have a need for a lawyer? Um, your characteristics your background that's n near irrelevant to me and it might uh, it might be not nice for some people to to hear that and and i think for some people their their identity in that sense is a is a big um is a big feature in in their lives and um it just hasn't been for me i'm i just i, I come to work to do work and i focus on the work um and it might also be, you know, where I grew up, I grew up in Bootle in Liverpool. And that's just, that just happened to be, my family were in Bolton and Bolton's are much more um, quite prevalent in, you know, there's a lot of Pakistanis around, um, a lot of people who migrated to the UK in the 60s. So my family moved to Liverpool because they bought their first business, which just happened to be there. And Bootle is a very low demographic place. Mm -hmm. uh, you can buy a freehold house in Bootle today for probably £80,000. Oh, wow. And you have a three-bed terraced house, and you can have freehold title to a property. And that um, that is quite something for most places in the UK, and it's certainly quite something. You know, If you say that to somebody who's only ever lived in London, they, it's, it's mind-boggling to them. And that's where I grew up and where I went to primary school, not so much high school where I went to Crosby for high school, but where I went to primary school in that area. Me, my brother and my sister were the only ethnic minorities in the whole mm. school. Um, and not, not just Pakistani minority, but, but out of the whole, you know, everybody else was, um, was, was, you know, just uh, what they were, they were white and, um, and I think I, I do wonder whether maybe that's why it wasn't so noticeable to me because there isn't these, uh, there isn't this, okay, there's a group over there, there's a group over there, and there's mm. this pressured kind of environment between them. Um, it was almost invisible. Um, so there, there's, there's where that, that was, those were my peers, my, all my close friends, my closest, oldest friends are from those neighborhoods. And we've never, We've never really seen those differences. Wow, that, that's really interesting. I just want to stop you there because mm -hmm. so basically, mm -hmm. even though you were the only kind of Asian in that school, you didn't suffer any racism, any discrimination, or did oh, you? Oh no, I'm sure. I'm sure. 
I'm sure we did. Um, but it's just not been so... I, I get the sense that, say, if you were in Oldham, where there was, you know, big, big groups of um, on one side and big groups on the other, mm. there's quite a lot of tension that builds. And you need, um, in order to have a battle, you do need participants on both sides. So we, it wasn't really, it wasn't like we were, you know, carrying the flag of Pakistan or Islam or anything like that at our school. Mm. And we weren't, we weren't significant enough in number to do so, even if we were so inclined. So... Mm. It's just not, and it just it just wasn't something that was so apparent to me. So it was very natural to me. We had um, a lady called Jean who lived down the road. She used to come to our house and, and do a bit of housekeeping with us. You know, Jean was in and out the house. Um, and a lot of my friends, as I say, from that background. And I I just think for me, we like, I'm not denying that I don't carry certain prejudices, but I, I think what I try and do is I focus on the utility, the work, the value yes. somebody brings, and that it's just meritocracy. And, and mm-hmm. if I focus mm-hmm. on that, you know, when, when we interview people at Ali Legal, and you know, I, I have had somebody who interviewed me and said, I've got pink hair, you know, I know it's a law firm and you've got an office environment, it's a professional, I dye my hair pink. Um, and they actually said that to us as a, this was um, before they came to the interview, an email that was sent in, will that be okay? Because they were ready to not even try because wow. they had pink hair. And to think that, and, and it's hard for me to, because I still feel like Akbar, the lad who grew up in Liverpool, who went to John Moore's University. And but obviously this, this lady with the pink hair thinks, you know, this is an MD of a city based yes. corporate law firm. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking, why am I even reading this? Are you like, I don't care. <laughs> like, can you draft a contract <laughs> i don't care what color your hair is mm. no i mean i i i i think that there is a kind of um a stigma attached to, to, to lawyers and, and law firms who are being snobby and, and having that corporate mm. image um and, and to be honest i've like, i've experienced that uh, myself mm. like for example even you know I've never had issues with uh, my name being mispronounced or misspelled. I know other Asians do sometimes have an issue with that. I, I just got used to it. But there was, you know, um, Pakistani uh, business owners that said, don't tell clients your name, just refer to yourself as Z. So, so they, they wanted to have that kind of image that, okay, for whatever reason. So I, I can understand why certain people feel like that. But it's good to know that there's a difference now. I think it, it was worse a lot. Yeah, more back then, but I think people are a lot more accepting now, um, and and you know, so it's it's great because you know your tra- trajectory has been great. So you know you've started off as a kind of like a news agent, and then you know you've gone into this career. You've worked for law firms in in, in Manchester and, and Liverpool, um, and now you know you've got the city law firm in 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 in, in London. So I think that's mm-hmm. the, the dream for many corporate lawyers. Uh, obviously, it can't have been easy, and and to basically go back to how you started this conversation with, you know, one of the biggest challenge of being an entrepreneur is having multiple ideas. Um, and I know before you started Ali Legal, you had a different project, which when we spoke last time, you know, it sounded like you wanted to conquer the world. And then when we had the subsequent conversation, you said, look, I don't want to conquer the world anymore. I'm going to focus on my law firm and grow it. Can you talk a little bit about that? Like, you know, yeah. what, what happened in that period? What were your ambitions? What, yeah. what were the issues you 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 faced, and, and and what what happened essentially? Yeah, no, that's that's a great question because that's really that's really the nub of I think what I found interesting in the in the last sort of five years. Yeah, um, that's been the most transformative thing for me. So for your audience and just you know for this discussion between you and I as well, that's really something that I would like to get out as a message, convey, meditate upon, um, for my, for myself as well, just the, you know, really, um, chew the fat with it a bit. Mm -hmm. So I, yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of, um, and, and just indulge me a little bit because this might jump around, um, a little bit, but there's a lot of, um, you know, you need to have a diversified portfolio. Social media will tell you in order to be rich, you need to have a diversified, diversified, uh, diversified portfolio and I think that idea stuck with me and there was other ideas there was a lot of um, plan B plan C hedge your bets a little bit you know do a few things and if something sticks that's good but um, and, and it, it really does sound obvious when I say it now 
Um, but if you don't give your attention to one particular thing, then um, you will detract. Obviously, you just spread too thin and you're not given anything um, a reasonable amount of attention. And that, I think that diversified um, portfolio, that's when, you've, that's when you've had your success. That's when you've got your money. You need to diversify when um, you're um, in the highest income threshold. You've got a certain amount of money in your bank account. You've got a certain amount of investments. And it's, it's no longer about creating it. It's about keeping it and mm -hmm. beating the market and beating inflation. So I think what I've become much better at now is critiquing what information is before me and trying to understand the perspective it's coming from. So often the perspective of um, this is what you need to do to be successful on social media, um, you know, very short term gratification, sound bites, low attention, just very small attention span things. Um, it's coming from the perspective of that's when, that's when you're already successful. And the, the, the reason they're showing and illustrating that to you is because that's much more attractive, that's much more glamorous. Um, but the bit they don't tell you is the creating the first 100K or the first million or the first yeah. 10 million, whatever the milestone is. And that initial creation and that initial build uh, requires attention and it requires uh, quite a narrow focus. So I have gone into this business endeavor and other business endeavors with um, that, right, I'm going to keep things diversified and do a bit of property, a bit of this, you know, I'll mm -hmm. start a business doing that, I'll do this, do this, do this. And, um, you know, something will stick. I'll, and I've, I've written down notes in, in notepads. I've written down, you know, this business will pay me 10 grand, this business will give me this, this business. Wow. And I've yeah. got, and I'm looking, I've looked back at these lists because I keep my old diaries and old, yeah. old notebooks. I look back at these lists and I was like, what was I thinking? And it wasn't until, um, when I did it with, um, it, it was called Ali Professional Services Group. Um, initially, when, when I started Ali Legal, so Ali Legal was a subsidiary of this broader group. And the idea was for it to be a multidisciplinary practice. So it was going to do accountancy, corporate finance, um, uh, mediation services, other things alongside law, things that complemented. And um, I wanted to go on a buy and build model. I wanted to. Um, do, you know, maybe maybe there was insurance brokering that would come into that. Maybe there was wealth management that would come into that. But and and this is this is a great idea. Um, it's a great idea when you're not a startup and when you've yes. got mm -hmm. two three million quid in the bank and you've got a lot to invest in it and you've got a, a board and a team that's very aligned and and you know quite simply my business and me myself uh, you know I just wasn't mature enough and wasn't I, I don't. I don't have that kind of money um, and I'm very much a startup and I'm bootstrapped and I'm building what I'm building through the cash flow of my trade. Um, so then I did this exercise with my, my accountant um, and that is one of the more, and I've said this before in other places, um, I, I have a really good accountant and he really, he really suits me as a, as a, like really compliments me as a character as well. Um, very happy with him. And it's just sometimes a wonder, you know, I just by chance appointed that accountant, you know, I could have had an atrocious, and I know many accountants, um, I could have had a terrible accountant, but I, but I have the one I do. And I'm very lucky to have him. Mm -hmm. Um, we have a monthly catch up and then I started really grilling down into the numbers. And to temper this slightly and be a little bit fairer to myself, I was making those decisions in the unknown before. Now I had some known, I had some actual figures that I could look at. Um, so now my decision making has been refined and um, I've honed that decision making based on actual information before me. So I can, I can, you know, be a bit kinder to myself um, with, because that, that is a fact as well. Um, and then I've looked at it and gone, actually, I don't, don't need to do that much to, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, I, and why I'm spreading my time in this way, why I'm looking at all these, other, I, if, you know, if I do this and have quite strict, and when I say we do things in threes, our financial model is, um, one of the financial, uh, policies, pro procedures in my business is, um, 
every single pound that hits the, the business account as income, one third of that gets put into the tax account. That's not our money that's gone. That's HMRC's money that we're managing. Mm-hmm. The balance, the, the remaining two thirds, one third of that goes into my reserve account. And then what's left is what I have to run the business with. Mm, okay. And that um, we can we can do the accounting, we can do the overlays, we can do the budgeting. But me just taking those steps, almost an autopilot. And yeah. actually, they are an autopilot because the bank is just set up to do those transfers. Um, that means I am never behind with any tax payments. Oh, that means really? I've prioritized my my own. Um, payments first so I pay, I always pay me first um, a lot of business owners they they um, feel guilty to reward themselves mm-hmm. they feel um, the need to um, suffer and um, you know come last after everyone else and yeah. that, you know that is the case but I think that it just does a little bit to uh, it gives me a little boost it gives me something a little bit positive you know paid myself up and I do, don't get me wrong, there's times if we're not quite there with the cost side of things and it's, or it's a little bit more of an expensive month or the billing slow down a little bit, I then dip into my side of the money and then bring that back in. But I just think psychologically that order and the, the, the divisioning of it as well is a useful exercise for me. Um, so these these things really, they come they come together to... Then, then create uh, something which is quite sustainable. And um, if I think about the job market and really get into brass tacks right now, you know, could I earn 100 grand, 200 grand, 300 grand as a corporate lawyer um, in, in whatever market? Um, so in a way, it's not my target, but it, create, it starts to create some parameters it starts to tell me you know and then it's like well what do I actually need it for so the the real the real conversation to be had with yourself is what are my needs you know um, and that that is reverse engineering from that that's been a very transformative thing for me as well where okay I know this certain amount of holidays I want want to buy a certain kind of house my kids need a certain something I need a certain and that is a quantifiable thing and then you start going right well how do I fulfill that need and, and do it all in reverse. So then when I really grill down into these numbers and go, okay, I can have the focus on that. I actually reclaimed quite a bit of my time. I don't work nearly, nowhere near as many hours as I used to. Hmm. Um, okay. I, I probably work, you know, reasonably, uh, still, still reasonably busy. Um, but I've got the focus, I've got the peace of mind and I feel, yes. um, you know, I'm feeling good. Um, as often as, as I can be. I, I try not to let myself get stressed. Um, and I, I live, in, live in the capital city of, of the UK. It's a very stressful environment. I get the tube every day. Um, oh. Sometimes you get the tube where it's completely packed and people are in it like sardines. But I'm still you know, quite centered, quite chill, enjoying my time and my experience. And what's brought that about is not setting up 10 businesses, not mm. On approaching it and just being quite focused and going, oh, actually, I don't need to do that. I just need to edge above the costs, create a level of profit for myself, which is not, it's not like a ridiculous sort yeah. of money. And then being quite disciplined and quite strict about um, making sure the costs are met, making sure the tax are met. We don't take any, on any debts. Um, we don't, um, and, and just slightly digressing away from this, the other part of this as well is, multiple businesses and the other thing was oh, i need to have multiple officers i need to have um 200 staff yes. I need to have a... it's all vanity it's all and it's yes. like um it could be that you need to do that and i'm not i don't want to detract anyone from growth and scaling and building and, and i love things like that. i love those stories about my clients as well but if you're doing it to um achieve the fulfillment of a need crack on if you're doing it because it's just an arbitrary metric that will make you appear cooler or you think it will make you appear cooler to your peers mm. and stop it. 
So that, that that's brilliant. I, I love all of that because there's so many lessons. There, but it, it sounds like it was just a continuation of why you got into law in the first place, maybe mm-hmm. you know, for the status mm-hmm. and uh, uh, the, the reputation. Because yeah. you know, um, once you <laughs> get into uh, like, it's, it's a weird thing because I know there are many entrepreneurs who I wouldn't call it an insecurity. Maybe it's an insecurity, but they're like you know they, they feel like there's a chip on their shoulder, or you know they've got something to prove because they haven't got a degree and they haven't got a qualification. On the other hand, I know a lot of lawyers with degrees and, and, and you know professionals who mm-hmm. feel the same way because they haven't got a business and they're not building something big. So it's like, you know, you can't win either way. Um, but it seems like you found that that balance um, and it comes down to knowing what, what it is that you actually want. Like a lot of people Absolutely. have got this kind of idea like, yeah, I want to create something big. But what does that actually mean? Like big for you or big for what you think other people are going to think is big? Because yeah. if you're chasing that second thing, you're, you're never going to find it because mm-hmm. there's no kind of boundary or limitation or there's no set target. Um, and I suppose that comes down from from really knowing yourself and what yeah. you want. Um, and did you, obviously, I know you went into the numbers, but did you do any, any other kind of deeper work to understand that? Or did it just come about from trying these different things? Because I know a lot of people are stuck in this rut mm-hmm. and they want to know how do they or how should they figure this out? There's still, I mean, I have got plenty of work to do still so i've got i've arrived at a place where i'm um calm and chill as often as i feel you know centered i feel safe um so i've arrived at kind of that place and it's it's not all the time like there's times when i don't feel safe there's times when i don't feel chill um Mm -hmm. but it's as often as possible um at, at, at this stage and there's still work to do i still need to know um you know if and I'm saying if um, I have a current need of um, I need a two million pound house in central London, there's there's a deeper dive into this as to well do I, you know, mm-hmm. and there's there's more there's more self discovery to go. And I, I actually like that being the case, you know, I like that it's an ongoing journey, um, and I don't beat myself up about not having all the answers right now, but that transition into fulfillment of your needs and and if one of your needs is starting a business i can really understand that and i can really relate to that because you know i i can name so many people who i I might have even spoken to you at one point where i was saying um you know how do i do this you know i want to start a business and and i've i've spoken to brokers spoke to other lawyers um and actually breaking into actually getting it going um is is the challenging thing um and then obviously continuing it is another thing um and there's there's an evolution of it from there but i certainly can relate to um people who um are at that stage and i think for those people i would i would if if anything comes out of this particular episode of your podcast if I start getting direct messages from people who say, right, how do I start a law firm or I want to start a business or I want to have a conversation with you about things that are going on in my life and whether I'm fulfilling my needs, I would be thrilled to have those conversations. That that would be something that would be really, really good uh, to come out of this because I think there's there's so many things there. One of them, for example, is some people aren't meant for business. Um, Mm -hmm. And I I have family relatives. I won't mention any, uh, the relation itself or the name, but I have family relatives who had had an appalling time personally because they were convinced that they must be in business and they must Mm. be a business owner because there's a lot of, in, in, as you know, in our circles, there's um, in, in sort of our family kind of backgrounds, there's that pressure of, um, you know, you should have a business and, some people aren't designed for it. Some people can't take their, what, what it is too pressured for them, that they don't really link into it very well. And then it, it make, I, I have seen people who've been diabolical because they are under pressure in a business. They can't deal with that pressure. And then mm-hmm. it spills wildly into their personal life. And there are plenty of scenarios where the what are my needs and how do I fulfill those needs and that self-discovery conversation should lead to actually business ownership is not for me and I think I do think a lot of 
older generations always talk negatively about younger generations. And I think one good thing that is coming out of uh, Gen Z, younger people, is people are, I think, assessing that a little bit better, that, you know, job v business conversation. Like, um, I'm seeing more and more that people don't feel the need to own a business. They don't feel the need to become yes. the responsible individual or the named person for particular regulatory roles. I think before people were running towards it without any real consideration. Um, but I think more and more now people, they, they don't need to be a partner in a law firm. They're perfectly yeah. happy being a consultant. They're perfectly happy doing a non-legal role if we just think about it from the legal industry perspective. Mm -hmm. So there's more of that. And I like to think that lends itself to people are having this conversation with themselves more and more and understanding their own psychology and their own wants and desires. In Absolutely. Order to no, I, I resonate a lot with that. And, I, th and yeah. I think you are correct. I think obviously our generation group with you had to become a professional, you had to become a, a, a lawyer, a doctor, whatever. But then I suppose over the last decade or so, there's been a kind of opposite in that, you know, you need to become an entrepreneur, you need to build a big business, you need to have big goals, but that's not for everybody either. So there's people that just need to be, you know, professional employees and we need those people and there's people that need to be entrepreneurs. But I suppose because of social media, because of the internet, there is a hybrid model now available that you don't need to be a big business owner and you don't need to be a professional. You can carve out something for yourself. However, the, the tricky situation is, is that, in my opinion, people are not being given an accurate a picture of what it's really like mm. to either pursue that career or start that business where, you know, people are trying to sell courses online and, you know, there's a lot of content out there. Um, and, and I know you mentioned it earlier in this conversation that typically it's people who have already built something and they're trying to diversify. <laughs> I'd say there's a lot more people that haven't built anything, but they're trying to build an income and they're trying to give this impression that they've built something and mm. they're giving the impression that building a business is easy anybody can do it it only takes you know a little bit of graft and and, and then you can, you're going to be up on the races but that's not the reality the reality is it takes a lot of time and pressure and energy and also it also comes back to that you know what do you actually want you know a business do you want to build a, a 10 million pound business a 100 million pound business or are you happy just replacing your income with a a 5 to 10k a month kind of gig because it gives you more time, freedom to do what you want. Um, and I suppose that's the conversation people are having now more. Um, but I still think that there needs to be a lot more accurate kind of description of what it is to make the jump into business and entrepreneurship. And you know, that's one of my goals with these podcasts and, and, and bringing on entrepreneurs like yourself. Um, and I think, you know, uh, if people obviously, you know, should take you upon that offer if they want to reach out to you because you've been there and done that. Uh, I suppose it leads nicely onto the next question, which is what next then for, for you and Ali League? Like what, you know, you kind of reassess the situation. So where do you want to take your law firm in the next five years or 10 years? Or what what is the ambition now? So um, the it's there's, there's a few things that I, I'm looking at acquisitions. Um, so I'm looking at other law firms to grow through acquisitions. And I think now that I've really understood um, you know what we want to do as a business. We don't. Uh, it's not a vanity play for me. It's not. I don't need to have three hundred people mm -hmm. um, in my employee. I don't need to have ten officers. So I, I've got a handful of law firms that I've evaluated from a perspective of the complementary services. Are they running their business? Uh, not not exactly like mine, but are there are there things which are fiscally responsible? which I, because I, what I don't want to do is bolt onto a law firm and, and bring in fiscal irresponsibility. Yes. Um, so I want to continue that. Um, and I also want to, the, there's, you know, there's a couple of law firms I'm looking at with some very senior partners, people have really spent their time and I, I'm looking for people to learn from. Um, I'm looking for, uh, you know, my own continued education as well. So there's that growth through acquisition uh, we're, we're looking at um, doing exactly what we've done in London and Dubai. Um, a lot of the community in the UK, the business community, is um, either uh, offshoring into Dubai or they're straddling both jurisdictions. And we've already done a bit of work with uh, in, inward investment from that region. So we, we've got networks there. So I think... Um, and, and it also allows me um, 
and it's a bit of a selfish endeavor. It, it puts me back into that startup phase yeah. again, you know, get the office, get the first few people in, employed. And uh, that's really the bit I enjoy. Um, and we, we also, so that's the kind of, that's the kind of um, growing, scaling the business stuff. And then there's really bedding into the business as usual. Um, it is, um, it is quite uh, a paradoxical thing where once you've got through the start of phase, the first three years and, you know, the accounts all work now, the case management system all works now mm. and there's less and less that sort of um, needs your attention from a startup management perspective. So being able to say, you know, I'm going to come into work and it will just be a process and it will just be a system and it will be a chain. And then you go home again and then you come back and do it again. Then you go home again and, and just getting into the mundane routine of it yeah. in, in, in a way. And that for me is, is a challenge. And I think, I think it's a challenge for a lot of people who, who would set out to do something like start a law firm because they're obviously a thrill seeker yeah. um, and the thrill <laughs> is starting to become less and less so you have to start finding something else in yeah. the boredom or, or yeah or something you know something brilliant, uh, brilliant. Fulfill that need as well so there's that i think for me personally and as a business um and a lot of we, we've got a young well actually we don't we have a pretty balanced team in terms of ages but We've got a couple of young people. We've trained two people now, and they've qualified as solicitors. And I think for a law firm, we've got we've got ten staff uh, right now, including myself. Mm -hmm. And for a firm that started in um, twenty twenty, we're taking training very seriously. And yep. my business partner, um, Sabria Murthy, she's a co-director in Ali Legal with me. Um, the discussion we had was um through our legal journeys and you you may well relate to this as well the training contract is really dangled as a as a carrot before yeah. junior people and we don't want to we want to incentivize people and have them do good things for us and grow and and you know take ownership for the practice for positive reasons yeah. not for um holding something away or a deterrent or something yeah, negative yeah. so we want to do all of that positively so training we 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 start we initiate the conversation about training we start to work on you know how do we structure this how do we do this so training our junior staff is um you know one of my uh, if i think about here's my to-do list for the week mm -hmm. i have in my to-do list um you know there's this person who's working for us how do I, you know, what's their career journey? And we take yeah. our mentorship and our training of new lawyers very seriously because law is, you know, I, I'm, I'm a business owner in law, but law as a profession it is, um, I'm the beneficiary of people having done that before. It's a very restricted profession still. I think there's people who will argue that that's becoming less and less, um, but we still have, uh, you know, people know what a solicitor is. They know that they need a solicitor. Uh, there is a certain amount of the, the industry, mm -hmm. whether we've had, there has been certain mishaps here and there, but it still runs on trust. It still yeah. runs on integrity. It still runs on ethics and it will continue to do so in the future. So I see, um, I see us, there's the senior people at Ali Legal as custodians of the profession. Yeah. And we need to, we need to look after it. We need to bring in new people and pass that forward so future yeah. generations have mm -hmm. the same benefit that we have currently. Brilliant, Brenda, absolutely love that. And, um, you know, time is out now, but this conversation could go on for much longer. Um, so last last words, and, and where can people basically contact you and, and who is your ideal client? Yeah, I will never shy away from having that real conversation. If I can provide numbers, I will. Um, so that really, the, the client thing, you know, we get clients all the time, we get inquiries all the time. Anybody who's looking to buy and sell business, buy and sell property or litigating courts, we, you know, we do all that. But what I'm really interested in, and, um, you know, you, you're interested in it as well as those people who are uh, on a business journey or trying to be in one and they just want to have a real conversation and I'm prepared to have that. Brilliant. And, and where can they contact you? Where's, where's the best place to contact you? LinkedIn DM. Um, there's my, my email is on the alilegal.co.uk website. 
Um, and that, that's probably the best place to start. I'm very responsive on LinkedIn. Um, it's my favorite of all social media, so I'm, I'm regularly on there. Um, so, yeah, and I, I will get back to whoever, whoever gets Brilliant. in touch. Excellent. And I will drop the link to those in, in, in the comments and descriptions below. Akbar, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you for, for, for being here. I hope you found it as great as I did. Um, as for the view, I hope you enjoyed it as well. And I will see you in the next episode. Take care now. Bye-bye.